Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm super excited you could be here because mindset is everything. And when you want to run a very successful business, you have to have the mindset of a high-performance leader. But do you? Probably not. A lot of us don't. A lot of us fall short here. And we're going to fix that today. So with us is Jeremiah Salvin. Now, he is a dynamic, high-performance coach, engaging public speaker, and founder of the executive coaching company, Conquer Academy. Now, Jeremiah has an incredible background ground of grit and discipline, having run hundreds of miles across the Colorado Rockies, competed in mixed martial arts cage fights, and served as an Army Ranger officer and light infantry company commander. Now, while still on active duty, Jeremiah began building his leadership coaching business from the ground up, leveraging his experience training troops to develop a methodology for helping high potential individuals defeat their excuses and achieve maximum success. Now, in 2019, he pivoted to entrepreneurship full time and has since coached hundreds of people to become leaders and high performers in their personal and professional lives. Beyond private coaching, Jeremiah now shares his expertise on an international scale through platforms like entrepreneur.com, Forbes.com, TED Talks, and corporate training. Now, his areas of specialty include the tools for high performance leadership, developing mental toughness, becoming an influential leader, building discipline and consistency, mission planning for success, and using physical fitness to test your grit. I'm excited to pick Jeremiah's brain today on what it takes to operate at peak performance. Jeremiah, thanks for coming in, man. Hi, thanks for having me, man. And uh, to everybody tuning in, you guys sit back. I like to really give you guys practical stuff that's going to help change your life. So i um, excited to be here and provide value to your audience, man. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it. So you've had an interesting, interesting history. And, you know, what do you what did you find personally? I'm interested, like, what were the biggest challenges that you faced going from transitioning from the military environment um, to being an entrepreneur to like what you do now to be able to teach other successful leaders? I mean, the biggest thing that I had to get used to was that when I transitioned out was um, just, I mean, honestly, like Zig Ziglar said this, he said, you build the people and the people build the business, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very true. And if you want to succeed in anything in life, whether it's business or just your own personal success, you need a team to win. And so the biggest thing that helped me as I transitioned out is I started building relationships outside of the military before I transitioned out. You know, I built my dream team. I, I surrounded myself with world-class athletes, entrepreneurs. I got mentorship. And I basically had, if you look at all these people like ammunition, I got out of the military with not only a weapon, but I got out with all the ammunition I needed to hit my objective. So I wouldn't be where I'm at without mentors and coaches and people that helped me during my transition. And that's been been huge in every step of my life, because th there was a point in my life where I just tried to do everything myself, you know, and my, like my mentor taught me, he said, Jeremiah, bro broke and broken people are Imas. I'm gonna do it myself. And he said, if you really want to win and be successful, successful people build dream teams. And so when I started working with him, he really helped me cultivate um, relationships outside of the military. And I find that, you know, a lot of a lot of businesses get stagnated and plateaued because the leader fails to grow. Right. They forget to it's usually not a matter of what they need to do. It's who they need to become and who else they need to add to the team. And so for me, that was a big thing is I just surrounded myself with the right people as I got out and it made the path a lot easier. You know, I'm curious. I, I think that everybody I talk to wants to do what you're saying. And money is just seems like a roadblock with a lot of them. It, it meaning that they either don't have the money they need to invest in that mentorship or coaching or think they don't, right? To me, it's a prioritization problem, but, or they don't have the funds available to be able to invest in the A players they need to grow the business. I would imagine you run into this all the time. I think it's one of the biggest things that our listenership says, man, I would love to do this. It's just this, always, I'm always stuck. I can't get unstuck. Well, what advice do you give to people like that? Yeah, well, I'll tell people, it, usually when it comes to either grabbing more talent, expanding your business, or doing anything in your life, like you want to hit more personal and professional goals, a lot, of, a lot of people try to figure out the how before they figure out the what. So what I mean is that instead of trying to figure out how you're going to get the A player, you need to figure out who the A player is that you want to hire. You need to make the decision first. Once you make the decision, the strategy aligns. So what a person can really stop doing is stop trying to figure out your next steps before you've made the decision that you're going to hire the person. It's like buying a house. Okay. When it comes to goal setting and achievement, I teach this a lot to my clients. 
I said the way the way that your mind works is that once you know what you want, it finds a way to it, right? Like there's an a target acquisition system inside of your mind. If I if I'm traveling and I go to a new airport or a new city, I get off I get off the plane, I start traveling around, and I immediately think, man, I want some coffee, and I know exactly the type of coffee that I want. Even though I've never been in that city before, I can find my way to the exact coffee that I want. I'm like, oh, I want Starbucks. And then all of a sudden I pull up the GPS, I start searching for it, and I find my way to the goal, right? I didn't sit there and try to figure out what are all my coffee options and, and all the details. I decided I decided what I wanted first, and then the strategy comes. So a lot of people, or when you go to buy a home, right? Like a lot of people will say they want to buy a house, but they're like, oh, I don't have the money. And I, what do you need the money for? You haven't made a decision to buy the to buy a house. You haven't picked out the house yet. What house do you want to buy? And they're, you know, they they'll be clueless. So I always teach people like when it comes to goal setting achievement, it's just like in the military when it comes to firing targets, you know, from or dropping missiles. It's like you have an acquisition system. You need to figure out what you want first, and then once you've just made a committed decision on that, the strategy will start showing up. You'll if you don't have the money, like you in your line of business, if you want something and you don't have the money, you'll find a guy like. It's in your line of work. He'll basically, hey, let, tell me what your what your situation is, and here's the funding. So there's always re the resources that you need, and then most of the time, the problem is just the indecision that the person is make is dealing with. How big is this problem? Because I, I, I it's interesting because in personal and business, you're spot on. Like this is exactly how I think of it. Is that you know I'm a pilot. Like that's what I do for fun, and I've also have my sailing license. So in boating and in, in flying, like you have to know where you're going. Like you, you get it. Like I kind of know where I'm going. And I would feel there's a lot involved. But I'm astonished in, in life at how many people just have no freaking idea what the goal is. You know, like they don't know what they're even driving to, to accomplish on the personal level or a business level. And I see so many entrepreneurs get stuck in the tactical side of things. Like they're implementing and executing little steps towards, they don't even know, they have a general idea, but they don't have a goal. So to me, it just seems like this gigantic problem of people not understanding clearly what the goal is to be accomplished to then go back and develop the plan. But from your perspective, how big is this problem? I mean, it's a huge problem because a lot of people are like tiptoeing their way to their goal. They're trying to take step one and step two and step three and try to incrementally move their themselves to the goal. But it, they can move a lot faster. Like I always tell people that it's not time that's separating you from your goal. It's decision. You're just not making enough decisions quick enough. Like think about this when it comes to fitness and this applies to business too. If I want to get an incredible shape, well, time is a factor, but what's the bigger factor? It's decision. I got to make, I got to decide throughout the day what meals to eat, whether I hit the gym or whether I don't. There's all these micro decisions. And what I teach people is like, you're at the starting point of the alphabet. You're at point A and you're trying to get to point Z in your business or with your fitness or your life. And the fastest path to get there is all the small decisions that you're going to make along the way. So the more you deviate from the path, you try to skip letters. It, the longer it's going to take. You have to like constantly make decisions that are in alignment with the goal itself. So um, one of the other things my mentor taught me that I passed to my clients is that the fastest path to success is to replace bad habits with good ones, right? So a bad habit is being indecisive. A bad habit is, is opting out of the work that you need to do and allowing fear to take over. So what we really want to do is become really good at decision making, which the military helped me out with tremendously. You know, I, I was put in situations where I had to, um, you know, make decisions with my intuition. And, and anytime I didn't listen to my intuition, things almost got bad. I mean, there was this one mission that I went on. It was a three objective mission. I was a strike force ranger platoon leader. And I had about, um, I think we had about 60 to 70 operators on the ground that night. So we, we fly in and my task force was tasked with doing a capture or kill mission. So we were going to go into the mountains of Afghanistan and we were going to split our task force into three objectives, kind of like a triangle. And there was a northeast objective. There was a or excuse me, a northwest objective. There was a northeast objective and a southern objective. We were going to go in at night to conceal ourselves. We we're going to walk in about 10 kilometers, somewhere between, um, you know, six miles, maybe three miles, somewhere in there. And we were going to break off the task force and hit all these three objectives. Well, prior or during the mission planning process, we conducted surveillance on the enemy sites. And the southern objective, we saw a couple of guys coming in and out, but it looked pretty quiet. The northwest objective, we saw a lot of traffic coming in and out. 
guys walking in with guns, guys leaving with guns. And during the planning process, me and one of my leaders got into a discussion. We were talking about who was going to take which machine gun to which objective. Well, my intuition, my gut was like, hey, Jeremiah, you need to take the machine gun down to the southern objective. Yeah, there's just a couple of guys down there, but something doesn't feel right. You need, you're going to need that extra firepower when you get down there. But like a lot of leaders, my other, the other leaders I had on my team, I valued their experience, right? And a lot of them had been in special operations longer than I had. I was, a, I was younger than some of them. So I went against my intuition. I said, you know what? You guys go ahead because one of the other leaders wanted the machine gun. I said, all right, you know what? You go ahead and take it. I value your experience, your decision over my own. Even though my intuition is saying, don't, don't give him the machine gun, you take it down to yours. So I went against my intuition. I gave him the machine gun, the Mark 48. I took a smaller one down there, the 249, which we just had organic to us. Well, as we hit all three of these objectives simultaneously, my objective turned into a giant gunfight. And there actually ended up being four shooters, four fighters inside of a, um, basically a bunker. And they were firing at us with machine guns themselves. So we got in close quarters combat with four enemy fighters in a bunker. And inside of that moment, I was like, man, I wish we would have had the Mark 48. I should have listened to my intuition. So the, the parallels to the military and business are uh, are infinite. There's tons of parallels, right? But the biggest thing that stops a person from hitting their goals, it's not time, it's their intuition, it's their decision making. They, they, people get very accustomed to ignoring what their intuition is telling them to do, especially the further along they go. When you start getting to the $1 million, $5 million range, you have all this experience and you have some level of success and you actually become timid to mess up how far you've gotten. So you become more careful and you're not as aggressive and you don't trust your your intuition more, you, you start making decisions off of, um, off of maybe other people's opinions and, and, and data versus what your gut is telling you is right. So you start slowing yourself down naturally from fear when, when in reality that the person's intuition is telling them exactly how they can get what they want. I, I love that story. I love that. And it, it's interesting you make that point because I, I once did research and I'm like, you know, it seems like all this best stuff that happens to me happens on the tail end of the worst stuff. Like stuff hits the fan. Right. And then yeah. like, I had this giant leap forward. So I'm like, what could you have the good stuff without the bad stuff? And when I really looked into it in depth and I was real, I realized that 100% of bad crap that happened to me, there was clear warning signs. Like when I look back and I said that I'm like intuition, there was clear warning signs. So then it's, it, but from that point forward, it's hard to your point to recognize what is intuition and what is fear. You know, it's like, okay, well, when I get these things, like, is it telling me not to move forward or am I actually just, is it a fear thing where I don't want to move forward? So do you have a way to differentiate between those two? Because sometimes I realize I just don't want to move forward because of fear. And sometimes I don't want to move forward because my, my intuition, my gut saying like, don't do it. That I still have a hard time differentiating between that feeling. Yeah, I have a, I have a decision-making, I have two tools I can give somebody to help them make faster decisions. One is a decision-making checklist that I use when I'm at a crossroads. And the first thing that I do is like, there's three questions that I ask myself when I'm faced with a problem. First question is, what is my intuition or what is my gut telling me to do? And I just write that down. And I just put the first answer that comes up. The second thing is, what would my mentor tell me to do that's an expert in this area? Okay. And then um, the last one is, what's the harder option in front of me? Because I've learned over the years throughout the military and anything that I've done accomplished in all of our lives it's usually the hardest option, the harder path that pays the most, right? It's like, for me, I got successful in business when I gave up some bad habits that I had. I was drinking regularly. Like I wasn't going to work hammered and stuff like that, but I had a problem, you know? I'm drinking pretty much every single night and I was drinking on the weekends, but I was one of those guys that would outwork my bad habits. But the moment that I got, I let go, the moment I got rid of and took the harder path, got rid of that drinking, Everything in my life took off. Better relationships started coming. More money started coming to my life. More opportunities. So the harder path always pays the most. But those are the three decisions, the three questions that somebody can ask you or ask themselves to get clarity. And then the, um, I'll give you the other one. And actually, I got a bonus one that I'll give everybody too for decision making. Um, the second one is really simple. It's kind of a fun game that you can play with yourself on a variety of different decisions that you're making. Just take a coin and put your decision on both sides of the coin. So should I 
franchise my business, yes or no, right? And you've got heads is yes, tails is no. And you're trying to, you're kind of stuck. You're like, I don't know if I should franchise or not, whatever. Well, flip the coin up in the air and kind of leave it to chance, but ask yourself when it hits the apex, what do you hope it lands on? Okay. And when it gets to that apex, you're going to naturally tell yourself what you hope the coin lands on. That's your intuition coming forward. Your intuition will say, oh man, I, I, heads, I really do want to open the franchise and it'll hit. And you'll kind of be like, dang, I really was like, I wasn't expecting that answer. So that's a little tool, a little, little hack that everybody can use. That's a fun one to use. And then the last thing is that um, when you're really trying to solve a problem, you, when you're in a low vibrational state, you're only going to see problems. And when you're in a high vibrational state, you only see solutions. Okay. So when you're in a, a season where life is beating the hell out of you, I got back from my last Ranger mission. We actually went in and there was a barricaded shooter with a kid. And um, we went in to capture, kill this guy. We didn't know he had a kid in there, but he blocked himself off in a room and he started throwing grenades down on top of me and my guys. Most of my leaders got either concussed or shrapnel to the legs, to the arms. One of the team leaders in our strike force lost an eye. I mean, guys were bleeding, guys were injured. And then we had a partner force attached to us too. Uh, we had Afghan special operators that were on site on the mission as well. One of those guys got shot in the chest. Several, like a whole squad of theirs got taken out through, through grenades. So we're in this giant, we're in a, another firefight where we're trying to capture or kill this, this bad guy. Not only is he upstairs with the kid, barricaded himself in, he's firing down on top of us from a two-story building, but the compound that he's in, it's kind of built like a castle. Multiple fighters start popping up and they start firing down on top of us. And then the village that we're in is contested. So there's civilians inside of the village that we're in, but then there's also enemy fighters that have either taken over a place, a house to sleep or just kind of bullied their way in. They start waking up and start firing at us. Okay. And, um, and it, what ended up happening was we got outmatched that night, combat ineffective. And we had to withdraw, which is like a, for a ranger, it feels like a cardinal sin. You're like, you were, you're taught never to retreat. You always move forward, but we had to, there was no, there was no one left. So we pulled out, my helicopter almost took an RPG on the way out. And then the next day, a lot of the leaders that were in on that mission, they were getting purple hearts because they were wounded in battle. I was the the officer in charge, one of the officers in charge that night. And um, that was my last Ranger mission. So I actually ended up advancing and moving on with my military career. I had to go on to other schools. Long story short is that that night really took its toll, its toll on me. You know, if you've ever failed in business, you've ever lost money in business, you've ever maybe it, maybe somebody's listening and they went bankrupt. Well, leader guilt and leader failure can really destroy you and your life. And I felt like I failed like as a leader. I got into a very, very low vibrational state. I was thinking negative all the time. And I withdrew myself from my friends, my family members. I isolated myself and I couldn't find a way out. Everywhere I looked in those in that low time, all I saw was more problems. I just kept seeing myself as a failure from losing in combat, a failure as a husband. A fa Every, everywhere I looked, I just saw more failure. But then when I really started working on myself, I started, I dialed in my morning routine. I became more consistent. Every single day, seven days a week, I'm going to work on body, mind, soul. I'm going to train. I'm going to take away all my bad habits. What ended up happening is I started shifting myself from a low vibrational state to a high vibrational state. I stopped feeling like palm syndrome, poor little old me. And as I started feeling better about me, I started seeing solutions. I started seeing next steps in my life. I started getting more goal oriented, more focused. And that led me to some of the biggest accomplishments that you highlighted here, getting one of my, getting my mentor, running hundred miles, being featured in entrepreneur magazine, TEDx. But my point with all of this is that if anybody here is listening and you're, you're in a state of a season of where things are, are hard for you, stop trying to solve your problems and make decisions from a low vibrational state. Get yourself to a high vibrational state, work on yourself, get yourself right, and then the world will get right. It's great advice. And I love your stories and, and a lot of them deal with mission planning. What have you carried over to, to, to your coaching business? Like what have you learned from the military for mission planning 
that is crucial when you're you're teaching people how to just live better lives personally and professionally? Yeah, the, the biggest thing is clarity and vision. So when I was an infantry officer, um, one of my primary duties was to paint the picture of mission success for everybody on the battlefield, right? Like if I'm an infantry commander, I've got guys that have been in the military for maybe months. They're in my formation. I have seasoned leaders that have been in for years or decades. And I got to tell everybody in the formation what the mission is. So I had a lot of duties and responsibilities as a leader. I got to make sure the company's running. I got to make sure that all the personnel issues are straight. I got to make sure that people are ready to, to go overseas and fight. I got to make sure the company is good to go. But in order to accomplish success as an infantry commander and infantry officer, my primary duty, regardless of all the tasks that I had to do, my primary duty was to paint the picture of success for everybody. If I could install and give every single soldier, whether it was the private that just had been in the military for a couple of months or the seasoned leader that had been in for over a decade and a half, if I could give them all the vision of what success looked like on the battlefield, then every single person under my, under my command and in my formation could do their part to fulfill the mission. So in, in life, it kind of comes back to what we opened up with the podcast with, is I need to know what I want. I need to know what mission success looks like. The more clarity that I can have and the clearer the vision is, and if I can communicate that not just to myself, but to my entire team, then everybody can get, fulfill that mission. The how is less important. So like on the battlefield, when you do a capture or kill mission, I would get up there in front of my task force and I would tell them what the concept of the operation was. I say, hey guys, this is how we're gonna succeed on the battlefield. Here's the overall vision. And I would, I would just come in and talk big picture. Hey, we're going to clear this comp. We're going to come in from the south, and we're going to touch down right here in this location. Then we're going to walk into here. And then once we get here, we're going to clear the compound in a clockwise manner, just like this. And then once we're done, we're going to grab up all the sensitive site materials, the computers, phones. We're going to get back to the birds, and we're going to fly back here. If we have anybody that's wounded or killed, here's, our, here's what we're going to do. So I would paint the entire picture for everybody the big macro picture. And then I would hand the mission brief over to my other leaders and they would talk through all the details. So the primary, this is what the leader, you guys all need to know it, whether you're leading your home, whether you're leading your business, your primary duty and your primary weapon as a leader is your word. Your primary weapon is your word. You need to be able to speak, paint the picture, create a clear vision for everybody to accomplish the mission. And if you can do that, you'll increase your odds of success I mean, tenfold. You've talked about some really good uh, tools, including a few decision-making tools that you've talked about. You started to talk about habits as well. What do you find are some of the best tools and habits that a high-performance leader should have? I mean, the first thing is getting themselves right. It's like body armor, right? Um, you need to have a habit of taking care of yourself as a leader. If you don't have a habit of taking care of yourself, what's going to happen is you're going to build a company and then – you're going to pay the price in, in your health or your relationships. Like you have to take care of you. So if there's a, if, if we get attacked and like we're in a patrol base or something like that, me and you, the first thing that we need to do is put on our own individual body armor so that we can fight. We're not good to anybody if we're wounded in battle, right? So a, a simple habit that everybody needs to do is you need to have a, um, a respectable wake up time. These are simple things that everybody can do. Basic level things, seven days a week, not five days a week, but seven days a week. You need to have an early wake up time that you abide by. You need to listen to your wake up time. Listening to your wake up time is how you build confidence. It doesn't matter what time you set. All that matters is that you set the time and you follow through. And then you get up and you work on body, mind, and soul. So what body, mind, and soul means is that you're going to do something for your spirit, if you're religious, that could be the Bible or I journal. I journal every single day and reflect on how I can be better. You're going to do something for your mind. That could be reading a personal development book or some quotes like some stoicism. And then you're going to go get your training session and do something for your body. From there, the next thing you do is all day you manage your workout program. So you make sure you're on a good workout program, take care of your physical body and your nutrition. Those are these are this is the fundamental take build the best you tasks and habits okay now this is really important because life will get stressful and what usually happens is people will break with those habits they won't abide by their wake up time they won't do the morning reflections the journaling the reading the workout 
at some point in time, they're going to have a season where life is hard and they're going to want to opt out. Leaders aren't needed when times are going well. Leaders are needed when times suck. So the job of the leader, if you want to grow your business, it's not, can I grow my business when everything, when the economy is doing great? It's, can I show up when things suck, when things are hard, seven days a week? Like Jeremiah had COVID. He went for a six mile run in the snow. And then two days later, he did a pod, he did a podcast, a guest on a podcast. Then he did a coaching call for a whole week. He's just not, he's becoming immovable, right? That's what we want to do as leaders is we want to be unstoppable. Now, I'm not encouraging everybody to go out and run six miles if you're not COVID. Okay. But what I'm saying is that the fundamentals for high performance start with just simple daily disciplines that everybody can do early wake up time, body, mind, soul, custom nutrition, custom uh, workout plan. And you do that seven days a week and become immovable with it. When, what are some other things like as a leader, you know, as a leader, I'm always worried that I'm not as good of a leader as I could be, should be, and want to be. What, what would you give advice to me? I think a lot of entrepreneurs are the same to be able to hone in our skill sets, to be able to become better leaders. Like, what do you tell someone like me that I should be working on beyond these things, which is phenomenal to be able to become a better leader? So when it comes to transformation, right, which is, which is what we're talking about, if you want to transform into the next version of you, the better version of you as a leader, there's four transformational areas that you have to figure out which one you're in and then which one you need to get through to advance. So on the left side, you have your starting point. You have the comfort zone. Okay. And I'll talk through all these and, and then give you some st action steps. But you have the comfort zone. Then you have the terror barrier. Then you have the pain cave. Then the potential barrier. And then freedom. Okay. So if you want to transform, first thing that I got to do is I got to get out of the comfort zone. The comfort zone looks like complacency. It's where you start to pack on a few extra pounds. You start feeling like a hamster in a wheel. Right. And you're like, shoot, I'm complacent. I'm kind of like over here, just kind of like lollygagging, just drifting through life. I got to wake the hell up. And then you got to make a decision to do something bold, right? I got to set, I got to, I need a new mission, either a mission for my business or a mission in my personal life. I'm going to go run a hundred miles or I'm going to grow the business. I'm going to double it this year, but I need a clear mission. And then when you make that decision, you're going to be faced with the terror barrier. If you're not, if you're not scared, you haven't made a decision that's big enough yet. You want to be scared. This gets you out of the comfort zone, but that fear is going to start taking over. So you got to work through the fear. Once you get through the fear and you overcome that, things are going to start getting difficult for you. You're going to have to actually start doing the work, right? And when you start doing the work, uh, you go through all the seasons of business, all the seasons of life, family member issues, relationship issues, all types of stuff. So things are going to, life is going to start to hurt. That's called the pain cave. When you're in the pain cave, you just got to be consistent. You got to focus on not shrinking away from your goal but growing into the person that achieves it right so you gotta you gotta if you're failing in that moment where you're growing the business you're growing yourself you need to adjust and adapt and figure out how you can rise to the occasion right so pain cave and then potential barrier at some point you're going to keep going right and um you're going to keep being consistent and the things are going to get so bad that you're going to feel like just tapping it's going to feel like almost like you're 15 years old and you just had your first heartbreak. You're going to be like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. That's the potential barrier. It's the moment where most people app tap out, they quit. And if you can keep being consistent in that moment, you, really the way through the, the potential barriers through faith, you just have faith and you focus on your vision, you focus on your mission and you just weather the storm on the other side is freedom. So those are the phases of transformation, comfort zone, terror barrier, pain cave, and potential barrier. And if you want to become a better leader, you got to go through those four transformational areas. Jeremiah, powerful stuff. What about, how do you adopt your leadership style? Like you're dealing with different types of people. What do you recommend to kind of adapt your leadership style to be able to really earn the respect of your entire team? Or maybe you don't need to adapt your leadership style to conform to the different personalities you're leading. Well, the, the biggest thing with people like to build respect with them is like people are going to your team is going to look at you and they're going to make um, a gut or impulsive decision on whether or not they can trust you. Right. That's the first thing. So the best thing that you can do to earn the trust of your people before you even speak is just take care of your body. Like a person that walks up fit, it looks like, oh, this guy is disciplined. He follows through. That's what people are going to think. And then you got to speak and then they're going to judge you off of that. But there's a couple other things that you can do to really make yourself um, integrate with the team smoothly. And, and the biggest thing is you get an idea of what everybody's personal and professional goals are. And if you can 
get to know everybody, see where everybody wants to go individually, then your job as the leader is to create a vision big enough so everybody can fit inside of it, right? You can't do that if you don't understand your people. And then the last thing is I used to, when I was a new leader, I used to struggle a little bit with finding the line between being too friendly and overly professional, right? Like a lot of guys have that issue. They're like, am I getting too close to my team? Am I being too, you know, pat on the back, high five, that type? Or am I being too standoffish? Am I too professional? But the issue for me was that I hadn't become the leader. I was two different types of leader, right? I wasn't my best self all the time. I was two different people at work. I was very professional. But then out when I took off the uniform, I would, like I mentioned before, I had an issue part with the party lifestyle. I was making bad decisions when I wasn't at work. I was going out drinking too much, being a little bit impulsive. And I didn't have the best character. And so the real issue that I had wasn't that I needed to be more professional or less professional. The issue that I had is who I was when I wasn't being professional was an issue. Does that make sense? Like I was too afraid to bring the real me to work, right? And that's what we need to work on. When you can bring the real you to work, you don't have to find the line between being too professional and too liked. Like you just bring your fully authentic self. So um, those are some quick things that I think somebody can do to really just blend well with the team is what it sounds like you're asking. And I think the last thing I guess I would say is um, being direct is a form of respect. You know, a lot of times people cater to the team's feelings, how people feel. And they're constant. People don't like that. Like people want to hear and be shot straight. Now, your delivery, you're going to have to learn how to deliver directness to different types of people because not everybody receives it the same. But I'll tell you, if you're not being direct with people, what you're really saying is that you don't respect them. You're saying that you don't think they can handle the truth. But when you are direct with them, if I'm like, hey, Ty, man, I just want to be direct with you, bro. You got a, a booger hanging from your face, man. You're like, oh, thanks. I got it, right? <laughs> You're like, knock it off. Being direct with you. I respect you. I'm going to tell you. If I don't respect you, maybe I just ignore the problem altogether and go the other way. So those are just some simple things that somebody can do. It really makes me want to rub my nose and chat. <laughs> I know. For the record, he doesn't have a booger on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I consider it's been hours with you. I, I just, I, I love the the stories and, and how you've got to where you are and how you've used uh, this transformation from what you've learned with the military to be able to coach high performance leaders like you have. But I want to be a, a conscious of your time. So where could everybody go to learn more? Because, you know, we just scratched the surface of so much that you could teach us. So everybody that's watching here, what should they do next to go and be able to learn more? Um, I'm very... I mean, I'm pretty much on every social media platform, but if you guys want to talk to me the quickest, Instagram is the fastest path. You can just hit me up there and tell me what, tell me the podcast you're coming from. Just say, actually just say Ty, just say Ty, and then open up the conversation. So I see it. Um, or you go to my website, Conquer Academy, www.conqueracademy.com. And um, I'm on YouTube. I, I put out uh, videos there regularly, three times a week and I'm at a minimum. And um the other platforms are I'm less active on. So I would just start with those two, mostly Instagram and then my website and then YouTube or my podcast. I got a podcast as well that you guys can check out if you love more leadership and personal development. It's called Be the Leader. You guys can check that out on pretty much every uh, podcast platform that's out there. And uh, Conquer Academy, does it have link to all of your social media channels there as well? Yeah, it does. Okay, perfect. All right, Jeremiah, thanks for coming on with us today. Ty, thanks for having me, man. Guys, hey, if you, whatever you learn today, if you learn something, you're inspired. The biggest thing is like take action. I, you don't need to do it all. Just pick one thing and take action. That's my last message. Thank you, bro. And I don't think he even got that from my podcast to know how I end. But as you know, as I- Oh, talk, do you do that? <laughs> Sorry, dude. Sorry, bro. No, that's great, man. It's actually, it's a perfect segue. As I say, knowledge doesn't mean anything unless you take action, right? You got to take action. And as you can see, I have learned in my time in business that the best people that can educate high performance leaders are people that have been 
in the situation that Jeremiah is in. And there's a very, very, very small group of professionals that have done what he's done that have carried that over to be able to actually teach you how to be a high performance leader because there's nobody that deals with the pressure like what he's gone through in the military, right? So to be able to take that and successfully be able to operate under those conditions and be able to do what's needed to be able to successfully operate and then carry that over into the business world as a gift for us. So please take these two actions. First of all, go and follow him on Instagram. His Instagram page is awesome. You can see some really cool stuff there. I literally was there minutes before we started and it's at instagram.com forward slash Jeremiah Sullivan. And that's J E R A. M-I-A-H S-O-L-V-E-N. I'm going to spell it again. I know it's on the show resources page. I don't want you to have to go. I just want you to write this down. It's Jeremiah G J E R A M I A H Solvent S O L V E N. The next thing I want you to do is go to conqueracademy.com. Look, conqueracademy.com will get you to his social pages, it'll get you to his podcast. He's even got a store there with all kinds of cool stuff and other things as well. So make sure you go there. There's a lot of education, information, and the ability to connect with him on his other channels. And this is really the first step to becoming a high performance leader. You got to become a high performance leader. Look, the reason you got in business is because you're probably smart enough to realize that when you have a team of people working towards the same goal, you have a better chance of getting there faster and easier than if you're just trying to drive there on your own. Well, you can't do that if you're not a high performance leader leading the team in the right direction. And Jeremiah just scratched the surface today of what's possible when you get this down, when you become a high performance leader. So take the first step right now. Make sure you go to conqueracademy.com, like his social channels, it takes less than a minute, and you're going to be in the know, in the loop, and be able to get the education you need and get on the right trajectory to become a high performance leader. So thank you very much for tuning in. Make sure that you go to conqueracademy.com, that's conqueracademy.com, to take the first step towards becoming a high performance performance leader and leading a team that can really get you where you want to go in life and in business. Thanks for tuning in. Take care. Have a great day.